Uh, now, uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker for the day. Yes. Uh, OK. So as uh, an associate researcher at uh, ISEK, uh, University of Zurich, <coughs> Renu uh, Dr. Jenny Bentley completed her PhD titled The Guardians of the Land and Water, Ritual, Indigenous Belongings and Vulnerability, based on her extensive research conducted in Sikkim and Kalampong from 2008 to 2014. Currently, she is working on a research project on lecture storytelling, empowerment, and language learning in collaboration with the University of Toronto, as well as an applied anthropology project on ecotourism and indigenous knowledge in LinkedIn Zongo. This is funded by uh, the K2 Action Grant in collaboration with EchoStream and MLAS. These projects focus on knowledge transfer through modern media, such as animation movies, storytelling, interpretation centers, and ethnographic workshops. Further, based on uh, current fieldwork, she co-authored publications of the U for Anti-Corruption Resource Center that inform and advise members of a uh, development community, uh, maybe funders, uh, non-governmental organizations, etc., uh, with regard to anti-corruption measures on a policy level. Now, uh, let me also add that uh, Renu uh, Dr. Jenny Bentley has become a household name for research scholars like me who are particularly interested in the lecture community. Uh, having read uh, quite a few of her uh, uh, papers myself, uh, her writings are very vivid, and Renu is extremely meticulous and thorough in her methodology as well as uh, methods of research. Uh, her ethnographic work uh, in the Eastern Himalayan region comes as a very refreshing and a much needed departure from the erstwhile stagnant colonial anthropology. Uh, this I find is uh, very pertinent, especially uh, in, in the post-colonial context that itself encapsulates a plethora of discourses pertaining to representation and uh, multiple voices. Now, uh, without wasting much time, I would like to call upon our speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Jenny Bentley. Um, yeah, come we more, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Jordan, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited um, uh, for the opportunity to speak here today, and I'd like to thank the Wrong Ring Society for um, organizing this webinar. I am happy to see uh, familiar na names and some familiar faces uh, in the crowd that is listening today. I'm also very happy to see a lot of lecture names, also of people I don't know, so I'm very happy to not only speak uh, I don't know, globally, um, but actually to uh, members of the lecture community and engage with, um, with all of you here today on my research. So uh, I'm going to start my presentation. I hope this works. Getting into what Jordan just said, maybe about the voices and the post-colonial context in which um, I do define my ethnography. Um, I do need to clarify in the beginning that I in no way intend to speak for the lecture, nor is that whatever I am talking about a complete overview of uh, religious practices or their interactions with the environment. It is really based on um, my fieldwork and my interviews with um, senior Boonthings and elders in Zonggu. So for the people here who are not familiar with um, the region, the picture you see here is sort of the upper portion of Zonggu. Zonggu is an indigenous reserve area in the north of Sikkim, so it's reserved for lecture people. It has been that for more than a century now. Um, I conducted research there from 2008 until 2014. A little bit of research in 2006 for my master's, but the main chunk 2008 until 14. So this is the time frame also that whatever I'm talking about today will be based on. I have been back since, but um, haven't done research in that context. Um, so I would also like to mention Kacho Lecha here, Dr. Kacho Lecha by now. I don't think he could join today because he had other obligations. But we did a lot of this research together. He was working with me and um, supported me in you know, being able to even go into houses and talk with people initially, introduced me, um, helped me understand basic lecture. 
um, worked on translations with me, and more than anything, we kind of discussed a lot of things together. So this was crucial for this work here. Um, so this is a map of Zonglu, and um, to contextualize my research a little bit more, it is focused on the villages of Lingtem, Tingbong, and Pendong in Upper Zonggu. And a lot of it, will, what I'm talking about today, will be focused in and around Lingtem. And before I do start then completely, I would like to introduce the four main Bungthing to you um, that I'm very obliged to. In Zonggu, actually, the name used for Bungthing would be Padim. I am using Bungthing here because it is just more commonly used within the lecture community than the word Padim, but they would self-refer to themselves as Padim. Um, it is basically based on their ancestral knowledge, my webinar today, and um, they shared it patiently with me in interviews and conversations. They also let me observe, document the rituals they perform, and then come back ample times with questions um, on what is this and what is that. So. Um, here you see Neto Glebcha. At the time I did my research, he was the main boom thing in uh, Lingtang village and was in charge of the annual community rituals. Currently he's over 70. This is a, a bit older picture. Um, Neto is from the Tsetelim Putso, which is probably the oldest and maybe previously the only clan in Lingtang village. I will get back to this clan later on in my talk. Uh, maybe just a short remark on my lecture pronunciation. <laughs> I am sorry for all the mother tongue lecture speakers who might not find the words exactly reproduced as they would reproduce them. Some vowels are hard for me to pronounce. Uh, one reason why I joined the wrong ring classes was to work on the pronunciation of certain vowels that are not so easy for us. So please apologize. My apologies to all the lecture speakers out there. Um, the second um, Bung thing I would like to introduce is Kim Chok Lepcha. He is um, the senior Bung thing of Pentong village. He is in his early 90s now. So his clan is the Atim Putso. This clan is the clan of all the male residents of Pentong. Pentong is one of the only villages where all the male um, men living there have the same clan. The women would be married into the, the village. So um, according to his oral tradition, the Atim Putso, the Salong Putso, which um, was founded by Tikum Men Salong, that many of you will be aware of, and uh, the Garkum Tsum Putso are the oldest uh, clans in Zonggu itself. I will get back to the Garkum Tsum Putso just in a while. So, um, and actually, Lopan uh, Sonam Chiring Tamsan, that most of you will be aware of from Kalimpong, told me a very, very interesting narrative um, that he collected in uh, Pentong in the 1980s uh, when he was visiting the village. He said that the clan uh, actually received their name because they supported and protected um, Pano Gebot. Atim means um, big and of high status. So, then um, here you see uh, Doji Chiring um, lecture from Paya Dingwong. He is in his uh, late 40s when the picture was taken. He was among the youngest religious specialists I talked to and observed the rituals of. He was very knowledgeable though. His uh, father was also a Bung thing. And his father was, or he would be, but his father was a representative of one of the six families of the various hamlets of Tingwong that helped to organize the royal conscience ritual that will, used to be performed in Tingwong. I will get back to this also. It was performed by the clan I mentioned beforehand, the Garkum Tungputo. And here you see the last conscience boom thing. So he was um, a Santa Tasho lecture, uh, also known as the Nung Tasso. He uh, used to perform this um, ritual that was uh, sponsored by the King of Sikkim. Um, I interviewed him in June um, 2011. Uh, sadly, he uh, died in, the after, in an aftershock of the 2011 earthquake uh, when he was 84 years old. So I could never go back and talk to him more about that first initial interview I did with him. Um, so today is actually i don't know if you call this an anniversary but it's been 10 years since the uh, earthquake in 2018 it was on the uh, 2011 what am i saying it was on the 18th of september 2011 uh 6.8 6.9 on the richter scale it um had a massive impact on sikkim but the main area of devastation was up in north sikkim and also centered around Songu. so it had a big impact on the lives and the livelihoods of people 
I'm not going to show a lot of images, but these are just two uh, mirror images here of a road between uh, Linja village and uh, B. So it's on the way to Pentong village, but also on the way to Tolong monastery. Uh, that used to be uh, motorable, so you could drive up it, and we had to walk on. Um, but it was just completely destroyed. And here you see uh, one side of Bay, what was Bay Village. So the entire hill came sliding down and buried the houses on that side, except that one house you see in the picture. Um, so the earthquake also had a big impact on ritual practice at the time. Um, in the aftermath of the earthquake, I was in Zonggu and I met, this is an example, the Lin Jabun Singh, and he um, basically said, you know, I, I have no time to talk to you, I have no time, I have to run, I have lots of rituals to perform. So there was a, a massive increase of ritual activity after the earthquake. So um, today I'm kind of going to talk a bit about why ritual practice became so important after the earthquake to restore a sort of form of normalcy. But also I will unravel an indigenous way of conceptualizing the world, the environment, and all the beings that inhabit this environment, and the interactions between them. So um, I based this webinar around two community rituals in um, Zonggu, because rituals are the interaction with the supernatural. Um, so they are both rituals that protect the village and the livelihood of the people, so the crops, the animals, and the wider environment. They are preventive rituals uh, performed for community health, personal health, prosperity, social harmony. So the first one is Sotap Rumfat. Um, Sotap in Lepcha means hail, but it is not only to prevent hail, it is a ritual to protect the village and the crops from natural disaster, um, destruction from, say, too little rain, too much rain, thunderstorms, hail. Uh, it is performed at the end of winter in the lecture months of Kursong or Tong, um, which would be either January, February or February, March. The second ritual is uh, called Chirim. Um, Chirim is performed later in the lecture months of Sum, which would be March, April or uh, Nungtang, which would be April, May, May-ish like that. The latest I've ever seen it perform was June. Um, and it's performed in order to prevent, to prevent diseases from spreading among the inhabitants or the livestock or also the crops. Um, it also averts um, social unrest, um, quarrels, harm, like that. So Chirim is most likely derived from Tibetan or Loke and uh, would mean common ritual. There is though also um, a lecture word called Rimru, which would mean formal uh, religious uh, ceremony. Um, the fact that the name is from um, Loki would um, in, has to do also with the connection with the royally funded ritual, the Conscien ritual, which I'll be talking about later. So um, each of these rituals has a specific place in um, in. Um, Zonggu, where it is performed. Here you see the ritual place for Chirim in Pentong. Chirim is always performed in a more secluded place. It is considered the more dangerous ritual and not that many people attend it. This place is quite impressive. It overlooks the whole valley on a rock. Uh, Sadaq Rumfat is um, performed in a more accessible place because traditionally the village leaders were elected during Sadaq Rumfat. So here, the only time I could observe this from happening, it still happens. Uh, was in Nampatan, a village outside of Zonggu, just on the opposite side of the valley. Here you see the Bungsing of Nampatan and the newly elected uh, village leader called Gyapan. The Gyapan is a Tibetan title that was given during the Sikkimese kingdom. It basically means a village administrator um, and they were under the Manda. So um, these elections still do happen, but they're only every three years, so I only managed to have a, see an election once. Um, so all rituals I observed, they have a bamboo or wooden altar um, that is called Tomsu, and it has like a platform which is covered with banana leaves, and it is always directed towards the mountains. Um, at the usually it's at the side. In this picture, it's in front. So at the side, you would have horizontal sticks where all the offerings are hung that the village community contributes. I mentioned this specifically here. You can see. Um, they will make these small little bamboo baskets 
and then the offerings, the Gyapam will go from house to house in the village and will collect uh, specific offerings from every village household. And one of the main offerings is um, a mix of various grains and these will be put into banana leaves and then they will be put into these baskets and hung at the side. The reason why I mention this is because um, this is the main contribution of the villagers. This is how they attend the ritual. You don't need to physically be at the ritual. You need to contribute to the offerings that are given to the deities. So on this uh, Tomsu, there is the Lofe offering. Lo means leaf or shield. And fit means to cut or to assemble, interestingly. So all this is very apt. You have cut banana leaves, but the leaves are like a shield, the question of protection, the protective ritual. And it is also the place where then the, the individual deities will be called on to. So this is a picture you'll be seeing again and again in my presentation, because um, on the Lofe in LinkedIn, this is from LinkedIn, there are four eggs. And um, I remember watching the LinkedIn boom thing write these signs on these eggs and I was like asking him what what do these signs mean so each sign um, basically dedicates the egg to a specific deity or a group of deities um, on when you're facing the altar on the left side so that would be facing more towards the mountains is a uh, or ne um, then in the middle you will find the conscientic which are the conscience soldiers I would to talk more about this in detail and on the bottom on the other side you find uh chadong razu which is towards the lower side and then in the middle in front you have the lungzi lungnang or how i will call them in this presentation the liangduk ongduk they are the guardians the local guardians of the land so first i will talk about the two opposing sides, so Conscient Monu and Chadong Razu, these deities and what they symbolize. Because based on them, I will unravel sort of a multi-storied cosmos that is the basic, base of, of a conceptualization of the world as um, told to me by the, the lecture uh, boom things. Um, so, uh, Nei Kanchenpunu resides in Mount Kanchenzonga, most of you will know of that, and is the main protective mountain deity. So he is associated with anything that is up, the upper realms, and the north. Um, there is not only um, Kanchen up there, there are other mountain deities and other supernatural embed embodied in the, the upper mountains. The word that the Bungthing will use for this positioning within the cosmos is Tol. You will find the same word in K.P. Thompson's dictionary as uh, tal or tal, I guess this is a local difference in pronunciation. It basically means above and upwards. From, um, so I suggest that this is an up that is still visible. So it is embedded within the, the geography, within the physical environmental space that the people can see, so the mountains in this case. Um, and just sorry to explain my graphic, I'm sorry it is a bit rudimentary. The line you see there is basically symbolizes the mountains and then the valleys going down to the plains. Um, and you will see this graphic again too. So um, Chadong Razu, on the other hand, that you see below, is associated with the lowlands, the plains, the south. And the Bungthings use the word Chol for that. Um, Similarly to many other Himalayan um, shamanic religious traditions, the upper realm is um, associated with the male mountain deities, with benevolent supernatural beings, purity but barrenness, whereas the lower realms are associated with female deities, fertility, but also with illness. So Chadung Razu Anyu is a female uh, deity. She is sometimes described as malevolent, sometimes described as the guardian of illnesses, but also attributed with the ability to cure. So I can't go into this in too much detail, but any supernatural I've come across, at least in lecture, um, religious tradition is ambivalent. There's always a good and there's a bad. There's some which are more ascribed to be mum, which would be more um, malevolent beings, and other that are more ascribed to be um, room, which would be deities or, or benevolent. But they all have two sides to it. I'll get back to this in just a second. 
Um, so what I'm saying here is that in my interpretations or experiences of what the Bunfings told me is that more than the characteristics of the specific individual deity, the distinction of their residency, so the these access like being a res resident in the northern realms and the upper realms or being below and keeping these parts separate. So the sense of spatiality is more important. So if we look at this is from um, a ritual performed by the um, Lingtempo thing. It is shortened, there are a lot more words in it, but this is the essence of it. Would be Chol nong bu chadong razu lianka nong mu. Tol nong bu ne konshen lianka nong mu. So they've called the deities to the outer, but it's very, very important that everyone goes back to where they come from. So this separating of the lower realms and the upper realms is um, very important within the understanding of the world through this indigenous lecture um, of epistemology. So um, what impacts the life of the humans and the residents is movement between these realms. So when deities from the up come to the lower realms. You have many such examples in lecture mythology. They are either transformative, but they are very often also dangerous. Like one example that uh, at least many lecture among you will know is, for example, for the consecration of the first marriage, um, they try to get yeast from the underworld, from some leaves among the guardian um, deity of the yeast. So all these animals. So everyone, please excuse that small technical glitch. My computer battery just died on me um, so I had to get come back in again anyway so I was talking about the movements between the different realms and how they are either transformative but also dangerous and um, talking about how you know they were trying to get the yeast from the underworld and of course she was protecting it and different animals tried to get it I'll not go into detail but basically characteristics of theirs changed but then in the end also the um, the actual produce of the local beer was also cursed, so it brought danger into the world, it brought, it, it, and it transformed something in the long run. It's always like that now. So um, in Zongu, there, with these two specific rituals I'm talking about, again, this is not exclusive, but maybe lots of other reasons and lots of other incidents in different rituals and different performances, but in these specific rituals, the uh, supernatural movement that causes this danger. Um, again, I am going to refer back to, um, on, let me get there. Why is it not going? Excuse me, let me just, what's wrong with my navigator? There you go get back to this image i showed you beforehand um so now i will talk about the conscient vic so it's because it, it is the movement of these um soldiers of the main mountain deity that bring the danger that cause the upheaval that requires the ritual performance so um, they are actually benevolent beings um they are um protectors of the mountain deity they reside in the upper realm but twice a year, they move down towards the south. And it is this movement that uh, requires the ritual performance um, by the religious specialists in Zongu. So um, this is connected to the conscient ritual that I was talking about beforehand. And this was a connection that wasn't I wasn't aware of and I'd not read anywhere. Um, before talking to the Lincoln Bunkling, actually. So in one of his, um, in his, actually all of his children um, recitations, he will say in lecture, this is translated, actually the Gorkum Tsumpto should be offering to you, but be satisfied with what I am offering from my side. So I went to look into what this was actually about. And um, so this, um, clan of the conscient boom thing that I talked about uh, is this is a very powerful lineage of religious specialists because this clan's chu, you know, every lecture clan has an associated mountain and their chu is conscient. So they are um, 
connected with the main protector mountain deity. According to a myth that was collected in the 1940s by Hartmann Seeger, um, the ancestor, the original, the first holder of this um, religious lineage, his maternal uncles are the conscience soldiers. So he's also related to these supernatural beings, according to the myth. And the original ancestor started a ritual in honor of the mountain deity after a snake, it's also a long story, very short version here, after a snake blocked the river and flooded the region and then he was asked to perform the ritual. And ever since then, these rituals were performed annually. So goes the myth. Um, then, and this is something we find in the mythology to the Chirin ritual, this clan um, supported the Namgyal dynasty in a war. Um, I assume this alliance dates back to the um, end of the 17th, early 18th century when there was the War of Succession. Uh, I've written about this in an article and I'll not get into it, but if anyone is interested, I can answer it in the question and answer or also in a personal communication. And um, so I'm not going to the historical details here, but the myth explains that the king requested soldiers from the residents of Songu and they didn't have any. So they performed a ritual to Conchin um, asking for support and he gave them through the ritual three animals. And these animals were brought to the battlefields and turned into um, diseases. With help of these diseases, the uh, Sikkimi's army won the war, but then the diseases started killing their own people. So the Conchin Bunting was called to perform a ritual to stop this. And ever since then, until 1975, this lineage used to perform a ritual twice a year uh, that was sponsored by the Trogyal, by the Sikkimese king. And one of them was at the eve of Pangdapsol, the main um, state ritual um, for Mount Conchin Zona. And uh, in Tingbong, each hamlet had a representative that was in charge of organizing this ritual. And the representative of Nun was the Bung thing, and then there were every other hamlet had one. And they all held the title of Tassel. So um, here you see the ritual site, how it looks currently, or a few years ago when I was there. And um, so what happened with this ritual was that. When the Conchin Bung thing went down to the royal palace, he was followed by the Conchin soldiers. So all these, the, the diseases, basically, these, these soldiers came down with him. And it was at that time that these community rituals were performed in every village to prevent the diseases from attacking their village. And um, when he came back, they went back with him. So... Um, Interestingly, even though the ritual is not performed anymore, the religious specialist does not go to Gantok or wherever the royal palace was at that time, and now it would be in Gantok anymore. But the soldiers still do. So the, in this um, way of looking at the world, in this ontology or epistemology, you, the, the ritual obligation, the obligation to the supernatural doesn't stop when the earthly obligation stops. They, it's still there. So. Um, um, there are, in present-day ritual practice, um, still reminiscences of this. So, for example, this is Chirim in Tingvong, and this is the altar for the Conscient Soldiers. They're separated in the upper and the lower realm, where they move along, and there's lots of paraphernalia. You can't see it that well on this picture, but they have walking sticks. But these are the long sticks. They have um, shields, they have clothes, they have strings for bridges. So basically everything is there to make sure they get down safely and get back up again safely and have it move through the lands as fast and as quickly as possible, which is also what the boom thing says. Pass through our lands, don't harm us, go back quickly. Um, in um, Pentong, there is actually still a ritual part called Paranap that is performed. Paranap in Lepcha means sort of closing, rounding off. Three days after Chiring and Satap Lungpat. No other village does it anymore. The Lingtem Boom thing remembers it. Other village Boom things remember it, but they don't perform it anymore. So this was basically the ending of the ritual when the Conchin Boom thing came back. The soldiers went back. Then the last part of the ritual was done. Um, so I... To end this bit of historical part, I theorize that this is not exceptional. You know, that ritual practice was adapted to when a war happened, when new things happened. This is not exceptional to lecture 
ritual practice or religious epistemology because religious ritual practice is an interaction with the supernatural that adapts to whatever new context is happening whatever when an incident happens it requires an interaction with the supernatural that you share your space with um, another example which is not which is also a bit historical but not connected to any political changes would be in the mid 19th century there was a devastating landslide that came down Panang and Lingtem area. It is documented in Hooker, in the um, journals of the famous botanist. Um, and ever since then, there was a ritual performed annually against landslides, a rutfat. This ritual was performed until the last, about a generation ago, when the last boom thing stopped, he, he died, and then the next generation didn't do it anymore. So this was also an annual practice where an incident happened, it was a natural disaster, and it brought by an annual ritual performance that had to be done uh, after that. So now I want to come to the probably most embedded part in the life and the world and the environment of the people, the fourth egg on our um, altar in Lingtem, which is the Liangdok um, Umdok, or the Lungzi Lungnan, as I've written it here. So um, this translated liang and ung means the land and the water and the word dok means protector but importantly also means owner so these supernatural are described as the um not only the the non-humans that protect the lands they are also considered owners and or co-owners of the land the environment the space in which the people live so this is a very different way of looking at the world and your environment. It doesn't, the land you've bought or you have registered in the land um, the revenue department is not only yours, it also belongs to non-human beings. And similarly to how you would have to interact with human neighbors that you have or animal neighbors that you have, you also need to interact with them and the specific rules and specific courtesies of how these um, interactions happen. So um, another important distinction is that in colloquial lecture, when they talk about the sacred space or the mountain or the sacred bamboo groves, or uh, since it's World Bamboo Day today, the sacred bamboo groves, um, they would say, for example, Kanchen Tu. Kanchen Tu is the mountain. Whereas ritual language is very clear when they call the, the deities into their abodes and into the altar, they say nangu, which means those ones that are living there, that are sitting there. So it really is in a sense of residence, of living in this space. Um, so in the, um, oh, this is the image that shows sort of in these between lands, between the trajectory of up and down, you have the middle realm, which is where the humans live, which is where the liangdok umdok are and where the upper and the lower date is passed through. So um, it, the ritual practice, the community ritual practices, they are prayers in all directions, as the Bungfing says here, to protect the space. So and there's a very specific way of how the guardians are called upon that I will kind of show based on the LinkedIn rituals how they close off, they activate different guards to close off the, the space and get divine protection. So, I'm sorry, this is uh, probably not so well visible. It's a very old map and I haven't had time to make it new. This is Lingtem village. Um, the, just a short description, the, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? I think you can see it. Yes, you? Renew. Yeah, yeah. so you can see uh, just so you can orientate yourself, this is the, the Rongyong River, and these circles indicate the sections of Lingtem village. So he would be passing down. This circle here is up is lower Lingtem, upper Lingtem, then here we have Songklong, and this is Panang, that is technically not considered a part of Lingtem nowadays anymore. But in the rituals, also in the Buddhist rituals done at the monastery, um is um uh it is part of their sort of ritual um perception of the land and this is lick op on the opposite side of the hill um the um so the boom thing i'm sorry i always want to go on to it 
it doesn't move forward with the cursor. Okay. So when he calls upon, and this goes back to what I said about that everything has two sides, the deities have, have, are ambivalent. So in the entire ritual recitation does not just call one deity or one being, it will always call a pair. So it's always a pairing. The entire ritual language is pairing. The pairing of two words is what in lecture grammar is called um, a kep. And if you make a sentence like that, it is called uh, ring shock. And this is the, the entire ritual language is framed like that. It's also not only in lecture um, ritual language. It's also been documented, for example, for the Marlborough language by, by Michael Opitz. So if in a ritual, this is again a shortened form. There's a lot more supportive words in it. But you would have, um, you so it would be like we are paying the small tax and the small fruit. So it would always be a pairing repetition. And this is important because it shows a way of um, perceiving the, the landscape and of how they proceed in calling the deities. So in Lingtem, the, um, the boom thing starts with calling... Again, for all the people from LinkedIn, I apologize for my pronunciation of the words, but um, it starts with calling Zung Tsum Hlu, which is um, this hill here on the uh, closing to the upper realm of LinkedIn. And then he will also, on the, from, on the Song Klong side, and then he will call uh, as the second one, and this is within the same rhyming verse, he will call Sum Phyok Hlu, which is on the um, the lower side of LinkedIn, closing to the lower realm. So it is not a circular movement like you would have in others. It goes in pairs, back and forth, back and forth, calling on God, on, on God and deities. So um, you would, I can't, if I use my cursor, it won't go further. Hang on, sorry about that. So then the next um, deities he calls on are Tundo uh, Chuopanu and uh, Lingdi Chu that are further above again in pairs. And here you see Lingdi Chu, this under the tip of that, um, of that leaf, that is Lingdi Chu seen from the other side. Lingdi Chu is quite a famous protector in the deity in the north of Sikkim, also connected to the uh, uh, flood narrative, similar to the one that you'd know from Tendong Lorong Fat. Um, so if we carry on, then Rongyong, the southern, the lower part, because it's lower to Lingtem, so it's considered the southern borders are closed. So here you see how in this pairing, it, it kind of makes a ritual close, closure of the boundaries um, to protect from any illnesses, any diseases coming in. Then here you see Rongyong River below Lingtem and the mountain peak in the the background. So then from the outer rings, they sort of move in and reinforce. So you would have a calling the, of, um, um, then you'd have Kimda, which is up here on the, in your image on the left side up, you'd have uh, Gongtyok and you'd have Padorkum, which are sort of towards the, the, the upper left side. And then on the Songklang side, he will call upon the other mountain deities there, Pamongkung, Lasung, Panu, and uh, Koryokkung, which are these down here, if you see my cursor. So again, it's a kind of a pairing in from the outside of a protective realm. So then, Again, he moves more towards the middle and more towards the, the very intimate stories and the Lungten of Lingtem. So um, you would have um, this section, you would have um, spaces that are connected with ancestral figures, with, um, with um, the clans that are residing in, in Lingtem. Like, for example, he calls upon Sumdo Gien and his abode Sadibong, which is a tree. So Sundogyan is actually a precious stone. And I'm not going into the details, details of the narrative because I don't think I have so much time anymore. But um, this is the um, connected to the Turtling Putso. So the ancestor of this uh, clan, Ting Morgan, he saw this precious stone, something precious blinking on the other side. He went to Adenchu, which is on the other side of Mangan, taking, took this stone back. It was sacred, precious item. 
and then um, he had it on him, but then he was going to a funeral as he was a moon, so he left it in one space, and afterwards it vanished, he went to find it, and it had taken its new abode in this tree. So this whole clan, this tree becomes the protecting deity of the clan and of the ancestors of this lineage. Um, similarly, in this part of the ritual, he'd call upon uh, Sambrankung, which is a bit slipped down in this image, which is a tree, I have an image of it. This is the boundary between upper and lower Ling Tem. It's a very old tree. And this again is connected to the, the whole narrative of Nam Fing Yu. She's a, a protector of Ling Tem and potentially a historical figure. Again, I can't go into details, but it's connected with a war. She was taken away and then she finds a way home. She brings home a walking stick and that walking stick is put in the ground there and becomes this tree. So all these sacred spaces are connected with the history, the oral tradition, the clans that reside in this space. So this intimate connection between the history, the mythology, the current day people, the past, the present, and the human and the non-human, and non-human in a very dualistic sense, the nature, but also the what we would call the supernatural residing within the nature. And um, then in the last wave, you would call on more um, embedded deities. This is connected with LinkedIn. And you also have, um, he calls upon the uh, protector of the monastery. So there you see the syncretism between Tibetan Buddhism and Lepcha um, religious tradition, which would be a talk for a different webinar. I can't go into that right now. Um, but it is all connected with the, the, the history of the people of the place and the mythology of the people in the place. So um, going further, one question that I feel still remains is um, why would they listen? Like you have these non-human supernatural beings, why would they even the Liang Dog Ung Dog listen to the rituals that the Bung Thing are performing? What empowers them? So according to lecture mythology, this also goes back to the time of the creation, where the moon and moon and the Bung Thing became negotiators between the human and the non-human um, actors and realms. So um, I, again, I'm gonna tell a very, very, very short version of the story since the time is short. Um, in the time of creation, the evil spirits, the Hmong, were, were harming the humans and the humans were powerless. They couldn't do anything to, to stop this harm from happening. So, and this is a narrative as the Pentong Boom thing told me. Again, there are different versions in different places with different data. So this is the Pentong Boom thing's version. Um, but the person I'm showing you is the uh, Ling Tembu thing, and I will explain why. Anyway, so the date is gathered under the guidance of Kumya Kumshirum, who's the god of knowledge, and they summoned all the evil spirits and all the guardian days, all the non-human beings of the land, to Azumpurtam, which is literally translated the meeting place. And here they negotiated with the evil spirit, spirits to stop killing humans, but in return, the humans would, would, would offer to them in form of millet beer, grains, blood, and other edible items in a regular basis. And um, then they were looking for someone who could perform this offering, and there was no one there. So the creator deity created the first moon and moon thing. So it was their basic job description, one can say, to do these offerings. And according to the Pentong Bung thing, the first uh, moon, who he calls Adi Azuk Munkup, um, received uh, ginger, a plant called parmu, and colorful thread, and a bundle of elephant graph, and this is what you see here, the pushor, to uh, use within the interaction with the supernatural beings. And this is still, the pushor is still something very um, importantly used in all the cleansing rituals. This is a, a image from the Namsung ritual that they perform at New Year. Um, so it is this contract that the moon and the boon thing had with the supernatural beings, which make them listen. And the moon and the boon thing are empowered through a lineage. And this is not a lineage that goes from father to son, from mother to daughter. It is in, in the spirit um, that goes from one generation to the next, but it can jump a generation. It can, it can go from nephew to father. So it's not, it's not a reincarnation in the sense of the Buddhist sense. It is a spirit that possesses you, that gives you these abilities. I'll give the boom thing and the moon these abilities. So 
Um, most of the rituals have a section which is the egg prediction, or the egg divination. And in the case of Lingtem, where it is associated with the deities, it adds an interesting twist to this contract. It means that they don't always listen. And the egg prediction is there to give you a sense of um, was the ritual successful or not. So successful ritual is measured by there not being any incidents. So it's actually recognized by a non-event, that like nothing is happening. Um, the egg prediction is as such that when um, the egg is nice, you know, there's an intact egg yolk, everything is good, then the offering was um, favorable. If there are some blood speckles or something, it could mean the date is not very happy, um, something, something might happen. And if there's a hole or a destruction of the egg yolk, then there will be death or larger um, incidents happening. Again here, ritual performances can be done to, to avert this. So now coming back to what I began my talk with, the, the earthquake and the, um, you know, the date we have today. Um, why would the, the Lung Zi Lung Nong be so important in the event of an earthquake? So I met the Pentong Bung thing a while after the earthquake and was, we talked and um, he basically said that we need to do the rituals, everyone needs to do the rituals and in the way he phrased it, the community, these annual rituals cannot stop the earthquake but they can stop the earthquake from harming the specific villages. And um, the reason why um, the, they can't stop the earthquake has to do with this multi-layered cosmos I have uh, told you about. But first I want to quickly narrate you what Pentong Bung Thing told me about how earthquakes happen according to lecture mythology. I don't know if every one of you is aware of this. So I'll just read this. This is a translation of what he told me. So Ipurum created the sacred conscience king and Mutli, that is earthquake king. She created these two, but there was no space for no place for humans because an ocean covered the whole area. So Ipurum thought about the human beings and where they could stay. She decided that Mutli Puno would lie above the ocean, and on his body she created soil, and this became the earth where humans could live. But Mutli Puno did not want to lie below the soil, so he moved below the earth and caused the whole world to shake. There was no control over the movements of his body. There were floods and earthquakes, so no human could stay there comfortably. Next, Ibburum thought about a solution. She decided that Conchin Pono would pin down Motli Pono's chest so he could control the movements of his younger brother. So what we have here is Conchin Pono, who's in the toll that I described beforehand, is pinning down Motli Pono. And what I... Um, or at least in my interpretation, I'm very open to discuss it. Um, see, is that conscience agency is um, he's in a different realm than Matli Puno. He's visible, he's on the earth, whereas Matli Puno is below. And this is also a distinction made in the rituals, in the ritual language. You have Tol, which is the visibly up, the vertically up in the mountains, and then you have Taba, that is a non seeable vertical up. And you have Chol, which is the plains, which is visibly down below. And then you have Meba, and Meba is below the world, the underworld, which is where the humans can't see or, or get there. So this is where Mati Ponu and also Ipudebubum stay. This is like their, their residency. So um, following this logic, the embeddedness of these deities within the realm that the humans can experience uh, within the environment, within the bamboo grooves and the hillocks and the nature is what makes the interaction with them possible. So the moon and the boom thing will interact with those deities that are living and are there within their realms. Um, so uh, the in this ontology, what I am proposing is that the deities that live with the humans, that stay with the humans, that are in the visible environment with the humans, these are the ones that are bound to ancestral knowledge, to myth, to the oral history of the region, um, 
they are both also open to change because every incident that happens requires a new interaction. So it's not something that is dead, it is a lived interaction with, with these beings that are there. So it is future orientated in that way also. And it is a, a, remains a valid way to overcome vulnerability um, in and through the Himalayan ecosystem that the lectures live in. But this, of course, only as long as the world is still conceptualized like that. So as long as this knowledge is still there, as long as the, the people, the lecture community, the young people in the lecture community that are growing up um, know about these interactions with the non-human supernatural beings living within their environment and know how to interact with them. And um, I think I'll stop here. I've already taken more time, I think, with my glitch that is happening here. And I'm open to questions and interactions and, um, yeah, anything people can't understand or didn't understand or want more, more details or clarifications on. Of course, I can switch. Thank you so much, uh, Anu, uh, Dr. Jenny Bentley, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, very enlightening. Stop sharing. Thank you, Renu.